Good morning, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first Sidney J. Blatt Memorial Lecture. We are very grateful to the Blatt family for establishing the Sidney J. Blatt Memorial Lectureship in his memory here in our department. Its main goal is to support lectures, symposia, and presentations yearly from uh, leading uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, members in the field of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and related areas. We're especially honored that Dr. Blatt's children and family are here today. David Blatt and his wife, Lisa Blatt, are here. Sid's daughters, uh, Sue and Charlie Gesh, are here. And Judy and John Casey are here uh, with us to celebrate this first annual lectureship. This is indeed a really special occasion. Sidney J. Blatt, or Sid, as we all fondly called him, got here in 1961, and he took over as uh, chief of psychology section in 1963. He was the chief for almost 50 years, 48 years, and when he took over, I I'm blown away by this, so I thought I'd share uh, it and comment on it. When he took over, he was one of two full-time psychologists in the department. And over the course of his tenure, we grew to over 100 full-time psychologists in this department and a very large group of voluntary and affiliated psychology faculty in our department. That, I think, is testament in part, really, to Sid's leadership. Sid was just an amazing leader. He was warm, engaging, respectful, um, really supportive of all of us who were growing up under him. Um, and most importantly, I think he was very open to different approaches. And so as a result, what thrived in this department was not just traditions of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic psychotherapy, but we grew in um, doing rigorous research in behavioral therapies, cognitive approaches, and really in the last decade and a half, in the last two decades, integrative approaches, such as dialectical behavior therapy and, and uh, ACT, um, as well, he was very open and challenging of, of uh, ideas um, that each of us would have and, and, and go to him. And it really uh, led uh, to a, a, a discourse that, that um, allowed us to think of different uh, um, ideas uh, from, from different perspectives. Um, so I, I sort of think of him and, and think of the rare leader that allows a thousand flowers to bloom. I think he really quintessentially represented that. Uh, we're all here today and um, what ended up happening is that this psychology section in this department became one of the largest and best uh, sections in the country. We're pretty formidable um, in any, compared to any depart psychiatry department or medical school in the country. Um, so I am, have much, uh, I'm really humbled by uh, thinking of that and have much gratitude um, as I think about that, and most importantly, um, really feel a sense of pride um, as I think of his legacy. So with that, I want to actually have you hear a, a very brief uh, introduction of uh, what Sid was like as an educator. So I'd like to um, invite uh, Dr. Dwayne Fan, who's our chief psychologist at, in the Yale New Haven Health System, to say a few words. Thank you, Rajita. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to have the opportunity to say a few words about Sidney J. Blatt. I had the extremely good fortune of being supervised by him when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Yale Psychiatric Institute. And I was also fortunate to spend 10 years with him on the psychology section's executive committee uh, here in the Department of Psychiatry. So some of you who are here today knew Sid quite well and like me, were profoundly influenced by him. But others here today may have never met Sid or may only know a little bit about his work. But let me say this, he was a great man. 
He was an international giant in his field who made enormous contributions to the understanding of personality development, psychopathology, depression, and psychotherapy. At the same time, this international giant was also a gentle, incredibly humble, and compassionate man who everyone around the world knew just as Sid. He was a prolific scholar who was known throughout the world as an expert clinician and psychoanalyst, who authored or co-authored over 220 articles. He wrote 17 books, held numerous visiting professorships, and he received countless honors from universities and professional societies for his distinguished contributions. His theory of personality development and depressive tendencies <laughs> integrated concepts of Piaget and cognitive development object relations theory, and psychoanalysis. In his contributions to personality assessment, schizophrenia, understanding the therapeutic process, and even the history of art have made profound contributions to psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic, and contemporary psychodynamic thinking. Very rarely does someone come along who can inspire and influence <coughs> generations of researchers and clinicians in the way that Sid did. Sid loved his work as a clinician, and he loved talking about it. He had a special way of connecting with students. He had an incredibly sharp and creative mind that allowed him to generate great insights about the developmental complexities that affect personality and shape psychopathology. In seminars and supervisions, he relished in the exchange of ideas and opinions. It was infectious, it really was. And when he talked, he would massage the air with his hands. He'd sit on the edge of his chair and just sort of massage the air as if he was molding his thoughts and smoothing out the rough edges of complex ideas. But when he did it, these gestures also seemed to reflect a childlike glee that he had, an enthusiasm for creative play within the playground of his ideas. It was his capacity to blend complex analytic thought with his genuine enthusiasm and creativity that was truly inspiring and enlightening. And in all respects, Sid was a great scholar, a great teacher, and a great man. Thank you. It's my great pleasure now um, to actually invite um, David Blatt to the, the podium to give out our plaque to our first uh, Sidney J. Blatt Annual <coughs> Lecturer. Our first uh, Sidney J. Blatt Annual Lecturer is Dr. Paul Wachtel, who actually is a Yale alum and one of Sidney's first students and um, a foremost leader in, in the field of psychotherapy and <coughs> psychoanalysis. Uh, Professor Wachtel, thank you so much for coming here. We really appreciate um, the opportunity and the time you've taken to come and um, speak with us. And on behalf of the Blatt family, let me uh, present you with this token of our appreciation. Thank you. This will be a very precious addition to my study. I'm really happy to receive this and happy to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Matthew Steinfeld, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology section, to introduce Professor Paul Wachtel. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my honor to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Paul Wachtel is a CUNY Distinguished Professor of Psychology at City College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. After graduating from Columbia College, Dr. Wachtel came to Yale, receiving his doctorate in clinical psychology across campus, as well as his clinical psychology internship right here in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, he went on to complete psychoanalytic training at New York University's postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. 
Um, he was a co-founder and has been past president of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration and um, has been a fellow of the American Psychological Association's Society of Clinical Psychology, Division of Psychotherapy, and Division of Psychoanalysis. And among many awards received, um, he's been the recipient of the 2010 Hans Strupp Award for Psychoanalytic Writing, Teaching, and Research, and the 2012 Distinguished Psychologist Award by Division 29 of APA. An internationally recognized expert in the field of psychotherapy and psychotherapy integration, um, Dr. Wachtel is the author of 14 books, uh, which have been translated into Japanese, Spanish, German, <laughs> Italian, Greek, Farsi, Turkish, and Polish, and over 300 articles, reviews, and book chapters. His research explores the ways in which proponents of different psychotherapies might bring together data and methods of understanding human experience that are often confined to particular theoretical silos due to unacknowledged assumptions embedded in partisan clinical practices. Paul's research conveys what many of his colleagues, friends, and students present in this room no doubt already know, that he is one of the field's foremost preeminent advocates for pluralist and humanistic values. He is a passionate advocate and is passionate about uh, engaging the intersections of intrapsychic, interpersonal, and societal dynamics, the political, economics, and social conditions that structure human experience, and forging common ground ac across uh, what are often constructed divides. It was moving to discover that the first entry on his CV under his very long list of publications um, is one to be found in the Journal of Consulting Psychology, whose entry reads, Wachtel and Blatt, 1965, and whose title reads as prophetic, Energy Deployment and Achievement. Um, I believe that I can speak on behalf of those assembled, that we are grateful for the ways in which you've deployed your intellectual energies such that this morning we can learn from you and hope that this award indeed is a satisfying achievement. Please join me in welcoming back to Yale, Dr. Paul Wachtel. Good morning. Uh, this is really a, a, a very special experience for me. It brings up many wonderful memories, I feel, very honored to be able to be the person launching what I hope will be a continuingly uh, rich series of presentations reflecting the many sides of, of Sid. Uh, I was really had so many memories stirred uh, when I think about my time with, with Sid. I arrived uh, at Yale about the same time he did, uh, but I had no idea he was a rookie because uh, I was a very, very young, but also even more than that, psychologically young, immature, in awe graduate student. So to me, Sid was already, on the day that I met him when he was virtually starting out as an assistant professor, he was already, the, in my eyes, the, the Sid Blatt that you've been hearing about this morning. Um, and he never disappointed me. Uh, he mentored me in many ways. I was initially assigned as his research assistant. Uh, I took some of his courses. Uh, then he moved to psychiatry, uh, but I wasn't about to let him go. So I ended up doing my internship at YPI and followed him. And then uh, when I did my dissertation, not surprisingly, I ended up doing it with Sid. Uh, so he was very much a part of my, my life, my emergence. I, I have one beef with Sid, uh, but it turned out all right. Uh, after taking so much care to guide me through so much through graduate school, he neglected to find me a wife. Uh, <laughs> so I had to do that on my own. Fortunately, that turned out very, very well. So I forgive Sid for that one bit of dereliction of duty. Um, as you know, among the most important concepts that, that Sid um, uh, explored was uh, the tensions between relatedness and self-definition. Um, and even though I'm going to be arranging more broadly than that, 
Uh, it seems to me the appropriate place to begin, uh, not only because uh, it was Sid's work that uh, uh, represented, is represented in it, but because it, it represents an element in Sid that I have tried to emulate in my own life, uh, which is attention to the, the intricacies of subjective experience in a way that also pays attention to uh, larger social issues and to rigorous research questions. Um, and also because it's a dichotomy, or at least it's often understood as a dichotomy, in a way that I think is misunderstood and misleading, but is diagnostic of some of the ways in which our field has been constrained, not Sid's thinking, but the misunderstanding of Sid's thinking, uh, and points to directions for how our field can advance further. Um, so first of all, the, the breadth and importance of this distinction between relatedness and self-definition. Uh, it really touches on issues that at the very least go back to the ancient Greeks and probably go back even further than that. We are a part of nature and we are apart from nature. We're separate, differentiated beings and at the same time we're part of a larger whole and we cannot survive without being a part of that whole. And we suffer from knowing our, our, of our death, we suffer from our separate existence, uh, but that is also what makes us uniquely human, and that is a core dilemma of human life. Uh, and similarly, not our, only are we a part of nature and yet apart from nature, the same is true with regard to society. We are a part of society. Uh, theories of psychotherapy, of psychopathology, of human development that don't take into account the social and cultural context in which we live really miss something and yet we're not a simple product of any culture or that begins to merge into problematic stereotypes. Um, and in the relational version of psychoanalytic thought, which is a version that I have been particularly interested in over the years, uh, still another part of this same dilemma is evident we are part of a matrix of relationships, we are embedded in those relationships, and yet we must achieve individual selfhood. And Sid was constantly aware of those tensions. Um, but sometimes relatedness and self-definition or in another set of terms that are often associated with uh, with Sid, the introjective and anaclytic dimensions <coughs> of, of human experience, uh, there, there's a tendency to think in terms of categories. And that is a problem not just for this concept, but again, much more generally. Uh, it's a, a problem when we think diagnostically in too categorical a way, losing the individual dynamics of the person and their relatedness to their context. Uh, but Sid did do productive work that looked at these as two categories. There are people who lean more in one direction or lean more in another direction, and there are important implications to that. Um, a seemingly more important variant of this is that people can be seen not just in terms of categories, some more anaclytic, some more introjective, 
but that these are two dimensions along which people vary, that becomes a little more sophisticated. That was also part of what Sid was talking about, but life is much more complicated still than that. Even though these ways of thinking, and you'll see, you'll hear this throughout uh, my talk this morning as I look at a range of topics, these ways of thinking, looking categorically, uh, looking linearly, uh, looking at dimensions, are certainly not without value. Much important research has been done uh, with that way of thinking, but there are also limits to it, which I mainly want to talk about. So let me give you some idea of the kind of research that I am referring to semi-negatively. Um, what I mean by semi-negatively is I'm also talking, as you'll see as I outline this, about probably 90 to 95 percent of all research that's done in our field. So I'm clearly not about to dismiss everything that's been done. It has value, but there are ways in which the very success of our research can mislead us because we become enamored with formulations that are the low-hanging fruit. Most of what we have done in, in psychological research, and there are multiple exceptions, let me be clear, and probably my guess would be in this room are many people who represent those exceptions. But nonetheless, most of the work in our field looks at what's easiest to do, which is to measure a few variables, find some correlations, find some linear relationships, and the very success of doing that can obscure a deeper set of ways that human beings develop, which is what I think Sid was pointing toward increasingly and what I think our field uh, needs. So, you know, study, correlational studies, people high on X tend to be high on Y, continuities across time, even experimental studies showing, you know, if you vary one variable, another variable will, will change. Even more complex multivariate studies. All of these fit within what I will call this morning the categorical linear way of thinking. And I will try to show some alternative ways of thinking to that and why that can be useful. So <clears throat> what I'm mostly going to be talking about is not data that I have collected. Our field tends to be strongly oriented toward data collection. And we don't really appreciate, I think, that research has uh, a broader meaning and we off, there's, there's often this sort of irony that psychology and related disciplines often are trying to uh, imitate the harder sciences and especially physics. And yet if you look at the way physics is organized, fit, among physicists there are experimental physicists and there are theoretical physicists. And theoretical physicists often don't gather any data. Uh, they try to point to the kind of data that would be relevant and leave it to the ex experimental physicists who have a different sort of creativity to interdigitate with them. Um, but sometimes theoretical physicists formulate ideas for which even the relevant observations are not yet evident, and yet their work is the cutting edge of our understanding of the physical world. I think in psychology we need to have a similar division and coordination of labor, 
and I think the imperative to collect data, if you want to have anything to say about data, actually impedes our field. So I'm going to be sort of boldly standing forth and talking about findings without reporting any of my own. Um, so what I'm going to highlight mainly derives from a theoretical vantage point that I've called cyclical psychodynamics. I call it cyclical psychodynamics because it is rooted in psychodynamic ideas, but instead of being characterized by uh, a linear depiction of continuities from very early in life being repeated over and over through life, it looks at how and why there is continuity from early to late, which if one understands that deeply also requires asking when and why are there absences of continuities at some times. Why do people move in new directions even though they've had powerful early experiences? And it's a point of view which I'll be emphasizing in which rather than linear causality, we look at bidirectional causality, that causes become effects and effects become causes and when you think that way, personality development looks very different. Um, just as part of the context, uh, Matthew mentioned the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. This is a venue uh, within which um, the kind of work I'm going to be talking about today is very much in the foreground. Uh, this year, it's an international organization, so it meets all over the world. Uh, it happens this year. It's uh, just down the pike, literally, uh, from New Haven. We'll be meeting uh, in New York in June, so any of you who might want to come and hear more about integrative thinking, uh, you're, you're very welcome to, to come to SEPI this year. Um, in furthering to start with the concepts of relatedness and self-definition in a, uh, a deeper way, uh, I think there is a way in which going beyond the different pathways that Sid outlined, uh, the differential ways that people more predominantly of one than the other direction respond differently to different therapeutic approaches. Uh, even beyond what Sid called the double helix model, where he talked about how the very development of one of these two dimensions enhances development of the other, uh, it increasingly <coughs> began to seem to me that we could understand these two as what I've called bound opposites. And what I mean by bound opposites is that you really cannot understand the development of either relatedness or self-definition uh, without reference to the other. And you don't understand it satisfactorily unless you really understand how one not only creates the other, but creates tensions that require the other. So that, for example, the more we are embedded in a relationship, the more we are lovingly attuned to another person, the more we are in conformity with the, the demands, the values of our tribe, our culture, our society, our subculture, our profession, the more there is then a need 
to differentiate ourselves, to not be lost, to not drown in that context. So it generates the need for self-definition. And the more we are self-defining, always with the threat then of being isolated, the more the need for relatedness is generated. So these are not just two separate categories. They are bound, interactive. It's sort of like when you hold two magnets and you sort of feel either a pull this way or a repulsion that way. They can't be understood apart from each other. Um, so, you know, just ways of saying this, uh, I, 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 I think I, I won't bother to read these sort of attempting to wax a little poetic about the same thing, but uh, it's, it's the tensions, it's the ways that the very nurturance, if you think, for example, in the field of family therapy, if you think of what an enmeshed family is, an enmeshed family provides a great deal of nurturance, support, relatedness, but at the expense of the differentiation and individual identity of any member. So it creates a need to break out. Whereas if you are in a family that is a disengaged family, there is a need for something that's not being met. Your, your differentiation is being fostered, but your need for connection is not. So these things create each other, and they can't be understood apart from each other. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and try to show how this general way of thinking goes beyond the issues of relatedness and self-definition. Uh, if we think of Piaget's concepts, uh, the way Piaget talks about the growth of schemas via assimilation and accommodation, again, what's important to understand is that ultimately, as different as they seem, as they're almost opposites, but they are bound opposites, that they can't be even really adequately understood without the other. And one example, a, a very simple example that occurs to me that illustrates this well is, if you think of a young child who's learning what a, what a dog is, he sees lots of creatures running around, some of them are dogs, some of them aren't, uh, they, some of them seem like very different things. You know, probably the early experience is more, oh, there's friendly things, there, there are licking things, there are barking things, there are biting things. It doesn't have a concept of dog, per se. Those are, that's a much higher level concept than the initial sensory, hairy thing, licking thing, etc. Begins to get a concept of dog, and he's Kids get a pretty good picture fairly early. But then he meets a Great Dane. And this doesn't fit. This looks, I mean, I, I still think Great Danes look more, more like horses than they do like dogs. I still think Chihuahuas look more like rats than they do like dogs. <laughs> but they are dogs. How do we learn that these are dogs? Well, in one sense, we are assimilating these outliers into our concept of dog. So here's dog, here are these other things, we just suck them up, pull them in, oh, now dog has got a couple of more categories. But if you think about it, the very act of doing that changes what we mean by dog. Before we included these outliers, Dog was sort of a creature of approximately this size. I don't mean literally this size. This is more the Chihuahua, but imagine me big enough to, you know. Uh, but then suddenly it includes 
the Great Dane and the Chihuahua, the very concept of dog has changed. So the assimilation creates accommodation. The, the schema changes by taking in. And at the same time, it is only through accommodation, through changing the schema, that you can take in the outlier. If you hold on to your original definition of dog, these things are not dogs. So there's this dynamic back and forth, even though the two processes seem like they're opposite, in fact, they work together. Um, and there are parallels in that to how we might think about relatedness and, and self-definition. Um, so again, there are, that way of thinking begins to diverge from the most dominant research models we have today where uh, they look at just the more of X, the more of Y, or X causes Y, and so on. Uh, and instead, and what I'll be talking about now, are more dialectical, non-binary, reciprocal, bidirectional, the whole range of different ways one might formulate this alternative understanding. Um, and uh, I want to, let me make sure I, yeah, okay, next one. Uh, I want to illustrate this with attachment. Uh, so we're now moving to a third area. We talked about uh, relatedness and self-definition. We talked about Piaget and assimilation and accommodation. I want to talk now about how this relates to attachment. Attachment, again, is most often studied in linear and categorical terms. Uh, the linear includes, and again, this isn't that they're, this is wrong, it's just that it's partial and needs to be contextualized in a larger context. Most studies of attachment look at things like ways that measure, early measures of attachment relate to later measures of attachment, or how early measures of attachment relate to other later features of the person's life. Uh, or they're categorical. There, there are these very useful, up to a point, categories such as securely attached, anxiously, ambivalently attached, avoidantly attached. And what are the characteristics of these people? What are the implications? Disorganized attachment being another category with particularly problematic uh, consequences. This is all valuable, but it, I think, doesn't capture the essence of the process. We need to stand back from it and look at it in a more bidirectional way. Uh, because the, the, Earl, the internal working models that Bowlby talked about uh, do not simply persist they create life experiences that recreate them. Um, and that is true for almost all psychological structures, that if we study them in terms of people of a certain developmental level, people of a particular personality type tend to behave in certain ways, tend to evolve in certain ways, we're both right and limited. There are, those relationships exist, but they're part of something larger. Um, in much, so that it doesn't invalidate that any more than, say, Einstein's theory of relativity invalidates Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics in our world, you know, where we don't tend to approach the speed of light terribly often. Uh, I, when I try to run, I don't even approach it uh, at all. Uh, but 
uh, even in the fastest of us or even the fastest car or the fastest jet plane, we don't come close. And Newtonian physics works pretty damn well. Um, it, uh, relativity theory didn't undermine Newtonian physics. It gave it a larger context and pointed to situations where there were crucial differences. One of the things that this other way of thinking, this more bidirectional way of thinking, particularly introduces, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit as we go along, is the idea of accomplices. What I mean by accomplices is that, in fact, if we look closely, our patients can only stay in the rut that we think we have a hard time getting them out of with a lot of help. You know, our assumption, because we are experiencing resistance, we're experiencing how hard we have to work to get someone to change, feels like the hard part is getting someone to change. The easy part is the person maintaining the pathological way of being seems like that's static and we're pulling and pulling at it and it's really hard to change it. I want to suggest that in fact changing stupid maladaptive behavior is very easy. Most people don't like to bang their head against the wall over and over again. So how come it looks so hard? It looks hard because we get a lot of help doing it. And the crux of the problem is how our patients get help in staying stuck the way they are. And what I mean by getting help is eliciting responses from other people that maintain the pattern because without that response from other people, the pattern isn't as readily maintained. And I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that as we, as we go along. Schematically, what this means is the internal state of the person leads to feelings and behavior in the world that elicits behavior and experiences from other people. And I knew that I would have some use for this at some point. Uh, the internal state creates the feelings and behavior in the world, which creates reactions of other people to our behavior, which feeds back again to recreate the same internal state, and it keeps going round and round in a, in a circle. So let's go back to attachment from this vantage point. Um, most researchers, most theorists agree that attachment has its origins in childhood. But if we want to understand why these patterns persist so much, we need to understand the role of accomplices. We need to understand the role of feedback. Um, so I'm going to skip this. It's too abstract. I want to, I want to get... Uh, I want to, let, me, let me just acknowledge there are these stabilities when, when I'm about to talk about how attachment is much more sort of dynamically fragile than we're used to thinking about it, potentially always in flux. I also obviously need to acknowledge the powerful stability. Can't deny that stability. Uh, people seem to persist in these patterns over many years, uh, across many situations often. Uh, so that's a reality. Um, but part of what we need to understand to begin to have a more dynamic and differentiated understanding uh, is that most of what we describe as a kind of almost essentialist characteristics of a securely attached person, a, a, an ambivalent 
romantically attached person, an avoidantly attached person, aren't really fixed properties the way, you know, all through life we continue to have a liver or a kidney. These are statistical probabilities. In other words, you wouldn't say, well, most of the time we have a liver, but every once in a while we don't. But you could say that about being securely attached or insecurely attached. The most insecurely attached person will at times act and relate in ways that we would have to say, judging from this behavior and this experience, that's what I mean by secure attachment. The most insecurely attached person at times is able to turn to others for some sense of calming, some sense of being attuned to and related to. People aren't of different types. We're talking really about statistical tendencies, not livers and kidneys, but probabilities. And if we bear that in mind, our understanding of attachment becomes very different. Um, I'm going to skip over that. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of these uh, uh, obsessional, just in case you think I'm saying something stupid, I want to show you. I'm, really have it taken into account, but I don't need to bore you with all of that. Uh, but I do need to find out why some of the slides have disappeared. Uh, talk about absence of stability. Yeah. Uh, all right, I don't know where, why these, these slides were absolutely in there, uh, unless they got described as, oh, now I'm all right, now you're going to see how a hopefully reasonably securely attached person relates to an object that has betrayed. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan it this way, but you have to make the best of... Uh, so let me just see... Okay, yeah, it, it is... I don't know why that's not... You can... You can I, I'll go back to the... Full screen in a minute, but for some reason this was feeling very shy. So let's <laughs> let's look at it this way. If it doesn't take up the full screen, it feels better about letting you see it. So, um, so take a, a typical secure child, and if we think about it, not in terms of a fixed property, but in terms of a dynamic, bidirectional process in which other people are accomplices, then let's think about what we mean by a secure child. Um, what it means is that this child is likely to anticipate that his attachment figure will respond to him in a sensitive, attuned way. And so he orients himself toward the attachment figure with that expectation. So what does that elicit in a mother or a father or another caretaker? If the child comes to you with, I need you, you're so important to me, I have faith in you, I know you come through for me, I get upset when you leave, but I am, feel so much better when you come back. What's that likely to elicit in the caretaker? It elicits that very behavior. It feels damn good when the child has that view of you. So you continue to be responsive, to show your most responsive side, because the caretaker, too, has statistical variations, so to speak. And so you act in a way that is likely to confirm again that secure expectation. 
so that the child will again act in a way that brings about that wonderful feeling in the caretaker. So the caretaker responds that way. The child again feels that good feeling, responds the same way the next time. It's a continuing circle, in this case a virtuous circle. But there are vicious circles in the realm of attachment just as much. Consider the uh, avoidant attachment. The child has developed the expectation that the caretaker is not going to really come through for me, that the only way to really feel safe and comfortable in the world is by not really needing him, you know, ignoring him. Uh, I didn't need you. Oh, did you go? I didn't even notice. What's that going to elicit in the caretaker? You're approaching your child lovingly, let's say, because again, we don't want to fall into the trap of essentializing the parents of insecurely attached people. Often you, what you have is a series of unfortunate accidents that concatenate and magnify just as there is always elements of insecurity in the most securely attached and vice versa, there are always, or certainly almost always, elements of real nurturance and responsiveness in the parents of insecurely attached children. Otherwise, in fact, they would be dead children, right? I mean, they lived to come to your office and show you their insecurity. They were getting an awful lot that helped them to live, but not enough. So you have a parent-child pair that has fallen into, let's say, the avoidant trap. The parent, after a while, kind of learns, this kid doesn't really need me very much, uh, doesn't seem to like me very much when I, am, when I do come back. Uh, he can handle it on his own. I'll, I'll go do something else. That, of course, reinforces the child's sense of there's not a lot of nurturance coming. So he again goes back to his, I don't need you. So the parent then goes back to, he doesn't need me. And it keeps itself going. And similarly with the anxious, ambivalent child who is a, a bundle of neediness. I need more of you. I need more of you. The parent begins to sort of want to tear off these tentacles, pushes the child away. That makes the child want it more. The parent pushes it more. It never can be adequately understood as a property of the parent or a property of the child. It has to be understood, if we want to understand it most deeply, as it becomes self-perpetuating in a bi-directional way. Um, so, now let me try to go back to the less shy. Uh, okay, this is the shy ones that we, we, we've gotten past them. Want to go finally to a realm that is so often these days easy to think of as bedrock, the brain. You know, there is a sense that, well, once something gets lodged in our neural circuits, once the structure of the brain has changed, that's a game changer. And in certain ways, of course, that's true. Again, you know, there, I'm not dismissing by any means everything that's been done up till now. But I think we need to understand the relation between brain behavior and context much more reciprocally as well. Uh, and again, let me be very clear, I'm not presumptuously assuming that I'm the only person who has had that thought. Many of you in this room are very possibly pursuing work uh, along the, these lines, but I want to highlight certain ways of thinking that I think get to a deeper level of understanding. So when 
we talk about a attachment, or when we talk even about early trauma, it's very often pointed out that these experiences change the brain, that they're registered right in the brain. And then the problem that sometimes comes up, if we are more mired in the linear thinking, is that the assumption is, okay, now it's fixed and not changeable and needs to be understood in internal terms only. So what I want to talk about is how the brain is kept in the state it was put in by the trauma uh, or by the early attachment experiences, the ways in which even these things that seem to go right to the level of brain require this kind of bi-directional uh, thinking. And key to it is asking ourselves as we expand the lens, what do we mean when we say now something has changed in the brain and the person is permanently changed? And here again, I want to insist that accomplices, and by the way, what I mean by accomplices is not people who are intentionally maintaining the problematic pattern, that's relatively unusual, not even necessarily people who are consciously or wittingly doing so, but people who are unwittingly drawn into perpetuating the pattern. Just the way when I was describing the, um, the way securely and insecurely attached children elicit behavior from the parent that keeps the pattern going. That doesn't mean the parent is saying, oh, now that damn kid, he's being insecurely attached, I'll show him. No, you're just drawn into it and it repeats itself. You become an accomplice, but it's often a, an unwitting accomplice. So the same will hold in when I'm talking now about trauma. So let's think about what we often mean by traumatized people and how it persists. Somebody has an early trauma and we can trace the pa a pattern back to that trauma that can include being very wary with other people, uh, maybe inclined toward intense and unpredictable emotional outbursts, uh, difficulty establishing intimate relationships, uh, difficulties concentrating that make it hard to perform at work, uh, sexual inhibitions or continuing anxiety. All of these are frequently observed consequences of trauma and are often thought of as consequences of the trauma, which they are if we think in a linear way and which they are correlationally, it's true. Um, but if we step back and think more bi-directionally and dynamically, we turn, it turns out the situation is much more complicated and that the trauma is not a, an event in the past but an ongoing process. Uh, so, for example, if somebody who's been traumatized is deeply mistrusting, they are not going to have the experiences of being calmed, being reassured, being meaningfully connected to others, which are part of the experiences that potentially could diminish the effect of the trauma and perhaps change the brain circuitry. The brain circuitry, in other words, partly looks fixed because it 
produces itself through its consequences with other people. It looks like what we see is somebody has a trauma early, certain kinds of brain circuitry become evident, and then you can look 10 years later, 20 years later, the same kind of brain circuitry is evident. So it seems very simple, right? Oh, it's now locked in at a neural level. But we need to ask, why does it keep happening the same way? It keeps happening because it keeps eliciting responses that keep then generating the same neural circuitry over and over again. I'm not arguing for you know, absolute and utter plasticity. Certainly there are consequences to all sorts of, of neural events. I am arguing for our being a little less certain based on really what are linear observations rather than opening the lens to see the larger picture of the person living in the world. So in the experience where we don't have the opportunity through some degree of trust that enables others to get in and reassure and care for and nurture us, the world continues to feel like a very harsh and dangerous place. And when the world feels like a harsh and dangerous place, we're not about to trust the next person we meet. So the world continues to feel like a harsh and dangerous place. It keeps perpetuating itself. Um, same, you know, another consequence of trauma often is uh, unpredictable or uh, inappropriate emotional outbursts. Well, what does that do to our interpersonal relationships? If that's the way we are with people, are those the people outside of your actual professional responsibilities that you choose to spend time with? You know, most of us would rather not in our private life. Uh, if somebody is prone to all these outbursts and inappropriate, you know, being upset with us, being anxious, being randomly whatever, you know, we say, I'll, 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 I'll have lunch with you next week. Uh, well, maybe, maybe in March. Um, those people don't get, again, the experiences that would change that very behavior. So it becomes self-perpetuating, but it requires understanding the response of other people to it to understand why it keeps going. Um, and, you know, in a society like ours, especially marked by such inequality, more, you know, if you think about, we all know, you know, and probably almost every one of you in here lives in a place you have chosen to live in, in part because it's safe. It's not only, oh, you know, it has X number of rooms, or I like the fixtures in the bathroom. First and foremost, often, so much, so first and foremost that we don't even think about it, you look to buy or rent a house in a part of the city or the area that feels safe. I think almost all of you, if you think about it, that was implicit in what you were doing. Why? In part because if you live somewhere that isn't safe, you're going to constantly be re-traumatized if you've been traumatized or traumatized anew, if you haven't been, living in an unsafe area is traumatizing. But if you've been traumatized and your capacity to concentrate, to plan, to diligently follow a path that will enable you to earn a living well is impaired, you're more likely to end up somewhere dangerous to live, even. And this is, this is not the primary thing I'm emphasizing, but it's an even here. So that you're more likely to be re-traumatized. And being re-traumatized, you're more likely to be still, again, 
unable to concentrate, unable to direct your efforts, and it perpetuates itself. All of these self-perpetuating, self-replicating patterns, they're harder to study. They require a more complicated mathematics, a more complicated methodology. So we're in a, I think we're at a point in our field that economics was in maybe 10, 20 years ago. Uh, economics, for the longest time, proceeded on, they, they had a different set of fallacies that, or limitations than we do. They proce proceeded on the assumption that we are remarkably and implacably rational. That, you know, we can calculate to the finest little gradient every anticipated pleasure and gain. And, you know, then you look around the world and you see all these mistakes and you wonder, how, do, how does this rational being do that? Well, in the last 10 to 20 years, uh, partly through the efforts of a few psychologists and economists who have won Nobel Prizes for their rethinking of economics, people like Daniel Kahneman and... Uh, uh, Richard Thaler, uh, they've introduced behavioral economics. But they are both the salvation of, ec of economics and a plague on economics because the plague part is part of why the economists made that assumption of rationality was because the mathematics was easier. Life gets more complicated when you look at the way people really are, then if you look at the way it's easier to study. And the kinds of phenomena I'm talking about, they're not impossible to study by any means, they're harder. It's easier to do a linear study, you know, to do a randomized controlled trial even, where you have a fixed protocol and you then look at outcome compared to psychotherapy research that looks at how, in fact, the patient and the therapist are evoking things in each other from moment to moment that are creating for every pair a different trajectory, but a trajectory that is a series of loops rather than a line. That's hard, but that's the way I think we can make advances. Um, and I, I've already alluded to the accomplices. I um, want to turn now to, a, to one other related term, developmental level, and a, you know, a slightly uh, different but lar largely similar idea, underlying personality organization. Here again, it's simplifying to assume this, and we can statistically find certain patients may more often do things that look, quote, primitive or archaic. Um, and we can make rough analogies, and they're very rough if you look at all closely, to the behavior of a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old. And then people get categorized and labeled as this person is stuck at a pre edipal level. This person has a borderline personality organization. It becomes something inside them that's just been stamped in. When in fact, I think, uh, here too, if we look closely we can see variations and importantly for psychotherapy, we can build on those variations. Every patient has a range of degrees of maturity, uh, adaptiveness, relatedness to consensual reality and so on. 
And yes, people can be described as this person's low on it, this person's high on it. That's a wonderful, stuck, fixed description. But if we want to be therapeutic, what we really need to be interested in is, okay, with this person who's low on relatedness and attunement to reality and so on, when are they slightly different? And what's going on then? And how can we amplify that? We can't ask those questions till we notice those variations and make them the foreground rather than the statistical average the foreground. So uh, these are some of the kinds of things that um, we're, we're talking about here. Uh, in, in a general way, I've, I've covered, I had for myself a whole list of themes that um, I, I thought I was covering. Well, maybe it'll come, it comes after. Uh, there's one, there's a particular way I want to end this, so that's why I'm concerned about whether I have another shy slide here. Um, I, mo much of our thinking really is a, a variant of the archaeological models first introduced by Freud and incorporated by many, many later theorists, including many who are not really psychoanalysts, many who aren't even, many including who are more biologically oriented. The idea of a surface and the depths and what you can observe and what's underneath, what's internal, often early, thought of as earlier, infantile, primitive, archaic, these are common terms. And, whoops, um, somehow that was supposed to show in the bottom half, I have to increase my PowerPoint skills. I thought, I tested it all out. It did it. There must be something. You must be accomplices in this, <laughs> right? There must be something in this context that's making the slides shy. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But in other settings, they're not as shy. So what are you guys doing to make uh, the slides shy? The, the uh, bottom half was a picture of a Mobius strip. You know, you, you mostly know Mobius strips, the, this wonderful mathematical construction. One of the fascinating things about a Mobius strip is if you take a strip of paper and you write outside on one side of it and inside on the other, and you just create a ring with the outside on the outside and the inside on the inside, what you'll find, not surprisingly, is you, you can go around the ring forever and the outside remains on the outside, right? And the inside remains on the inside. If you make one little twist to that ring, um, if I had a piece of paper I could tear, I would show you, you know, but you probably have seen them. You just twist it and then close it. The fascinating thing is you run your hands along the outside and suddenly, without lifting your hand from the paper, you're on the inside. And then if you continue along, again, without lifting your hand from the paper, you're back on the outside, you're going back and forth. That's, I think, a better representation of the dynamics of personality than the um, more inner, outer surface and depth kinds of Things. So we've, we've talked about a lot of things in some ways. We've talked about <clears throat> relatedness and self-definition. <clears throat> we've talked about Piaget's concepts of assimilation and accommodation. We've talked about attachment. We've talked about accomplices. We've talked about variability in behavior and contextuality. We've talked about trauma and the brain and interpersonal behavior vicious and virtu virtuous circles, 
bound opposites, bidirectional causality, the Mobius strip. Looks like we've been all over the place. But I actually think, oh, here, the, no, this, this is particularly a, sh a shame that it's shy. Uh, all right, we'll go back to, uh, uh, but this was supposed to do a little different. All right, so I think we've really just examined two things this morning. Um, one is how personality can be viewed in a more contextual, reciprocal, uh, bidirectional way, uh, cyclical psychodynamics, all the examples we've been talking about today. But the second thing is, and it feels it's part of why I'm so happy to be here for this particular occasion, is uh, for me, at least, what we've been talking about is the legacy of my having studied with Sid and had him as an internal presence for me uh, all these years. Um, I began with ideas very explicitly related to Sid's thinking, particularly relatedness and self-definition. Um, but I, it, I have also really implicitly been sharing with you a kind of internal dialogue that I've had with Sid ever since my days at Yale, uh, particularly around, I think, the one concept of where he and I uh, tended to differ, though I think we also have, had been converging over time, was around notions like developmental levels. Uh, and he was, I think, somewhat more receptive to traditional ideas about developmental levels and hierarchies. I was more skeptical about them. Uh, but we could always talk about them. There was always a sense that here was somebody with whom you could exchange ideas and your connection with him, his respect for you would not be threatened by disagreement which often as true dialogue is pursued could end up are also leading to an understanding of a deeper, le deeper level of agreement. And so I was going to, you know, in one of these just sort of, I, I'm, I, I don't have to tell you that I'm not an expert on tower PowerPoint, though this, this kind of thing hasn't happened to me before. But I, you know, I, the, the, the minor tricks uh, the silly little things that people do with PowerPoint. I w it, when this was going to be the full screen version, it was going to be animated. So I was going to say that he created the freedom to, to engage his ideas and to move in different directions. And I was going to say, I guess one might call that. And then, boom, Appearing across the screen would have been relatedness and self-definition as a way of ending up back with Sid. So without a lot of fancy PowerPoint stuff, that's how I want to end up back with Sid. And uh, it's wonderful to be here celebrating Sid. So thank you. I don't know what our, how much time we have. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people have had to leave, but if people have questions, I think Dr. Rocha was happy to Or Bob? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, given what you said, have said about uh, bi-directionality, reciprocal nature, and um, the uh, contextual aspects, and also given the time frame of your association with Dr. Rocha, I'm wondering what you thought, what he's thought about meditative traditions and Buddhism, and about the possible utility of psychedelic agents in psychotherapy. Well, I, th I, th I think, I, I'm not sure, um, 
I can't answer for Sid on those questions. Um, I would say for myself, basically what we've been talking about today are in a sense stuck systems, self-reinforcing systems. And so anything that shakes up that stuck system has the possibility of creating a, a new dynamic. Um, so I would say any of the, you know, the, certainly uh, meditation and mindfulness has of course become very mainstream, and I know Sid did write about that. Um, psychedelics are uh, still another way of potentially shaking up the system. Uh, I think from my point of view what would be crucial would be not to think of it as something that has its effect simply in and of itself, but as a generator of a different state of mind that could potentially elicit different responses from people and different responses within oneself that could then ideally become self-generating and self-perpetuating within the context of one's life. Uh, anything that shakes it up is, I think, potentially useful, but taking into account the, the context, the bi-directionality, the role of accomplices, I think is what would then enable it to be not just a momentary change, but a more enduring change. Yeah. I love your ideas, and um, it makes me think of a lot of my work, and I consult on um, teams when people have challenging behavior, and a lot of times we think that person's stuck, or they keep doing this behavior, and we just want to rid that behavior, you know? But it's so fascinating to think about the cyclical dynamics you're talking about. Um, and how we're a part of that process and a part of that behavior continuing to occur. Um, so if you're helping therapists and teams think about their process and their part in that, what are some general things that you would say to us so that we can be more aware of that unconscious process for us that, that continues that behavior? Well, I, I, I think you've already pointed very largely in the direction, in, in the direction of the answer to, to the question. Uh, it, it does lie in paying a lot of attention to not only what the patient elicits in us, but what we elicit in the patient, what our perception, uh, what our participation is like. Uh, I think in some way, um, going all the way back to Sullivan's ideas about participant observation, that we are both participants and observers is, is really uh, important. I also think that we need to be wary in the sense of the temptation, sort of almost the gravitational pull of the older monodirectional intrapsychic formulations even as they seem to be transformed into new ways of thinking. What I have in mind here is that, for example, in the psychoanalytic realm, a very common term that's used much less often today, and I, it's a good thing, I think, used to be acting out. Acting out was clearly a pejorative description of the patient. Now we have what seems like and potentially can be a more benign alternative that in fact is being used very largely as a substitute for acting out and that's the term enactment. The seductive and problematic elements of, attach of enactments is if you look closely at how many clinicians talk about enactments, they're still being talked about as something the patient is doing 
and we sort of walked into this buzzsaw, and now we're caught up in it. If instead we ask ourselves more in a, in a more um, symmetrical way, what's my role in this? And instead of thinking of it as, oh, it, it happened many times before in his life, now it's happening with me. To ask, for example, who doesn't it happen with? You know, if it's happening with me, that doesn't mean, oh my God, if it happens even with poor little innocent me, it's really powerfully built in. <laughs> if instead we ask, well, what am I doing that actually his friend Joe doesn't seem to do because he does seem to be able to interact differently with Joe than with me. It's true, he's interacting with me like he does with these other people, but almost always somebody in their life they're actually interacting with better than us. So to be aware that we really are participants, not just to use enactment as a newer, fancier brand of it's your fault, you know, or it's, li it's in your head. Yes? So I uh, have run as the Mobius strip as a concept in women's scholarship, in feminist scholarship. Um, and I'm just wondering if um, you might think we might have come to these ideas a little sooner if women's studies had been created a hundred years before it did, or something to that degree. I mean, certainly relational concepts are, you know, intrinsic in women's scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sort of thinking that would have been the case, but mm -hmm. I wonder if you agree with that. Um, well, I don't, I don't know the, the answer per se, but I, I, first of all, very much agree that one of the really important characteristics of women's studies has been a much greater emphasis on a relational, contextual way of thinking. Uh, but more than that, I also would love, I, I have to confess, I was not aware of the use of the Mobius strip image in women's studies. I've, I've written some things on the Mobius strip as, a, as an image without being aware of. So it's a good sign, uh, an indication of the very thing you're talking about, the way that these different areas are occupy different silos and aren't influencing each other. So if you could send me some references on that, I would be really appreciative. Uh, I don't know if you jotted down my email address. It's paul.wachtel at gmail. Uh, and I would, I would love to, uh, I can, I guess, I can use PowerPoint at least to that degree. Um, so if you could send me those, I would love to see them. Yeah. One last one. Okay. Um, I was thinking about what you said earlier about the difficulty of helping our patients change um, with the accomplices acting on them. One thing that occurred to me is there's not always a one-to-one -one contingency between the patient changing and the system responding in a different way. So, for example, if the patient is a mother and you know, the child is being independent and cold, and the mother says, okay, I need to be more warm and reach out, the child doesn't change right away the first time. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about how to help them keep the faith and continue working on it. Yeah, no, that, yeah, I think it's a really important point. It's a absolutely correct. And it's, it's partly why I was saying earlier when I was also dismissing myself as being too obsessional, you know, I had too many slides about, but that stability is also real. There, we are responsive to new experiences more than some theories have acknowledged, but we are nonetheless also sticky in that responsiveness. And so, first of all, we have to promote persistence in a way. We have to help people see how it, it is hard, 
how it, it isn't going to happen right away, but at the same time have a vision of how it can happen. But, but what you're saying really provides a really important corrective to what I was saying, because it could readily give the false impression that I was saying, oh, just ch change the feedback once or twice and everything will be different. And we all know that that's not the case. Yeah. Thank you so much.